Uh, so, yeah, like uh, he said, I'm going to be talking about unifying uh, Android, iOS, and web. Um, but first, I'm going to start off with a story. Um, so, in my free time, I like to go sailing. Um, and I like to sail on these uh, three-meter-long boats or so uh, called Mercury's. Um, and in order to go sailing, um, first you have to rig up the sail. Um, and in order to do that, you have the mass and you have the boom. And to get the sail on it, you, you slide the sail down the boom, and then you tie it off the end, and then you raise it up the mass. And these, these boats have a centerboard, so you have to lower the centerboard so you can... Um, centerboard acts as a keel so the wind doesn't blow over your boat. Um, or if you show up at just the right time, you don't have to do any of these things. Um, you can just get right into the boat and go right out. Um, and there was a time where... I showed up at just the right time, so I just got into the boat, and I, uh, the wind just took me out in the middle of the river, and uh, that's when I noticed the back tie-off was mistied. <laughs> uh, so I stood up in the boat, which in these boats makes it really uh, wobbly, <laughs> and I just kept trying and trying to retie it, uh, and I didn't notice that I was drifting closer to this bridge. <laughs> um, af after a while, I saw that I was way too close to the bridge, so I had to put down my sail. And so the safety patrol came out, and two guys had to hold onto the boat while I retied it. Um, and then they towed me back out into the middle, and I was good to go from there. So why am I telling you this story? Uh, because this, this is what it's like building for three different clients for web, iOS, and Android. <laughs> uh, you may have an issue in one thing that doesn't affect the others. Um, but you could, you could also have issues that start cascading into um, and start cascading into all of the clients, I, and then you get closer and closer to hitting a bridge. <laughs> um, so we, at Twitter, we, or my team, we looked at uh, looking at replacing our sailboat with a powerboat, but we realized the powerboat's going to have way more problems than our trusty old sailboat. Um, so I'm going to go over some just background and some issues with our with our sailboat that we're uh, facing, and then I'll talk a little bit about JavaScript um, and some Kotlin and C++, and then just some takeaways. Um, so um, I'm Justin. I'm the lead iOS developer for the video data infrastructure team. So we generate, uh, aggregate, contextualize, and serve video metric data. Uh, consumption metrics. So basically that just means we, we're in charge of generating watch times and view counts for videos at Twitter. Um, and across Android, iOS, and web, and on Twitter and Periscope, we process tens of billions of events per day. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of data that we have to do. Um, and currently, our, our clients are exactly as you would expect. Android has Java and Kotlin. Uh, iOS has Objective-C and Swift. And web is obviously JavaScript. And so this is our architecture for our clients. Um, it's really, compli really complicated, but here's our architecture simplified. Um, so the player uh, will send us tick events or uh, like every frame of the video will send us an update so we can see if we need to fire any events as needed. Um, and then we, if we need to fire an event, we send it to our network layer, which then sends it to our backend, where we aggregate it and uh, anonymize it and all, all that fun stuff. Um, so our problems that we face is, since I'm on an infrastructure team, we mostly deal with... Um, we have business logic that we mostly use, and um, we have three separate copies of the exact same events, uh, co the event generation code on all of our platforms. Um, and we provide business critical metrics, so they all need to be the same, and we all we want to make sure they're all tested to the exact same uh, spec and. Uh, we don't want inconsistencies between iOS and Android or web and iOS or anything like that. 
Um, so some of the requirements for solutions that we looked into, it needs to be small. Um, on iOS, it needs to be iOS and Android. The framework has to be less than a megabyte in size. Um, and on web, it has to be much, much smaller. Like if you went to the talk uh, yesterday about web resources, um, keeping it as small as possible is best. So we needed something that's less than a couple hundred kilobytes. Um, then we also wanted it to be debuggable, so we can uh, debug it, obviously, and find any issues. Um, but we want to be able to step through it and see variables and breakpoints like you would in a normal thing. Um, we needed it to be for P to be performant, so we need something that's fast or near native performance. Um, and we want something reusable, so we don't want to be the only team at Twitter using this. We want to be able to have anyone at Twitter be able be able to use it for any of their needs. Um, so we looked at some potential solutions. Um, so we looked at Dart. And so Dart is made by Google. And it's mostly used by Flutter. And if you missed uh, Abraham's talk from yesterday, um, it's a cross-platform, or Flutter is a cross-platform UI framework. Um, so um, Dart transpiles to JavaScript for web, and it um, and it also compiles to native bytecode for iOS and Android. Um, so we, we decided against it um, primarily because on iOS it has a runtime. But you might be saying, wait, Objective-C also has a runtime. Um, so we didn't want to have a third party runtime. Um, that was our biggest thing. And on iOS it also uses garbage collection. So we don't want to have, so Apple doesn't recommend having a garbage collector. Um, and there's not a lot of documentation about using it without using Flutter. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really why we rejected Dart. Uh, we also looked at using creating a DSL. So a DSL is a domain-specific language. So when I'm talking about DSL, I mean something like this, um, where we just pass in that string and it just figures out what it needs to do. Um, but we quickly realized that's going to be hard to build. <laughs> Um, and it, it's going to be really difficult to maintain, but um, it would allow other people besides my team to create um, video metrics if they wanted to. Um, but it wouldn't be able to be reused throughout all of Twitter. Um, it was another drawback. Um, which brings me into our first, uh, first powerboat, I guess, uh, JavaScript. So, so why JavaScript? Um, we have an existing code base already for web, and we have, so our existing code base, we want to be able to just bring it to iOS and bring it to Android without really changing it too much. And um, team experience, so everyone on, on my team has some experience with JavaScript. And then we have platform support. Um, JavaScript also obviously works in all the browsers, so it works it works great on web, and iOS has native first-party support for it through um, JavaScript core, which I'll get into in a minute. And the the only real issue we ran into is Android doesn't have a great JavaScript uh, API like iOS. So JavaScript core is Apple's framework for JavaScript. Um, it's thread safe. If you use, it's thread safe. Um, trying to get into the, the JavaScript virtual machine, but obviously the JavaScript virtual machine is single-threaded. Um, it does have semi-automatic uh, bridging, which I'll get into in a minute. So it will bridge objects between native code and, Java, and JavaScript um, almost automatically. Uh, it has full debugging support, so you could go into Safari with the iOS simulator and have breakpoints and variables, uh, but that was before Xcode 11, where they removed that functionality for some reason. Um, and then, so some of the issues with it, it's string key based, so it's, it's, um, so if you want to call a Java class or function, you have to give it the exact string of the class or function, which isn't great. Um, it doesn't have type safety going across the bridge. Um, the interface really isn't that pretty to use it, uh, but the, 
these couple of things you could solve with some Objective C runtime thing. Um, that was kind of outside the scope of what we were looking at. Um, and but JavaScript core only supports ES5. So we would have to ha use like Babel or something, which makes debugging it much more difficult. Um, performance wise, it's pretty performant. Um, so this init time is loading our entire JavaScript library um, on a iPhone 6 plus. And then, so this total time is over processing every frame over a 15 second video. And memory uses about a meg or so. And then our bundle size only increases by our Java, JavaScript uh, framework size. Um, so let me get into a little bit of the bridging. Um, so let's say we had a class like this. So this is just a tweet class as a constructor and has two methods, uh, get hashtag and get user mentions. Uh, so they just parse the text and for the hashtags and the user mentions. Um, so in Swift, we would do something like, uh, in Swift we would do something like this. Oops. We do something like this uh, to load in that script. So we first get the URL for that file uh, in the bundle. Then we load it in as a string. Uh, then we initialize our JavaScript context. Um, so I'm force unwrapping it here, but uh, it's not actually marked as nullable. So I think this, it's a bug with the Swift uh, layer there. Um, but anyways, so we take that JavaScript context and we tell it to evaluate our script. And then this with source URL doesn't really mean anything. It's just there for uh, um, logging, like if you did console uh, log. Um, and then we just return our context from this method. And then we can we can use our JavaScript something like this. So this creates a tweet class. So first we get the class type from our context uh, with the string of its type. And then we just tell it to construct itself uh, with our arguments. So our uh, integer, our text, and our user class. So our user class is not included in the Swift Foundation. Um, so it's, it's actually defined something like this just with the username and the display name. Uh, it's a pretty simple user class. Um, so in order to get this over to JavaScript, we have to do something like, we have to, we have to define the protocol for JavaScript core to, uh, to port over to JavaScript. Uh, so that's just this. So we just create a protocol with all the methods and properties we want, we want to expose to JavaScript. Um, and then we just conform our object to that protocol, and then it just works. Well, you first have to register it with the JavaScript context, then it just works. Um, so JavaScript on Android is not as simple. There is multiple solutions to this problem. Um, so there's duct tape by Square, and there's J2V8. Um, and then there's Hermes by Facebook. Um, so Hermes by Facebook came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's only for React Native right now, but it's really cool how it works. It, um, at build time, it compiles your JavaScript and it will run your JavaScript as, as compiled code, which is cool. Um, but it only supports React Native, so we didn't really look too much into it. Uh, I'll go into React Native in a little bit. But uh, so duct tape, uh, it's by Square. It maps primitives across the bridge. So it does uh, strings, ints, uh, what have you, uh, across the bridge. If you want to send complex objects, like our, our user class, you'd have to use JSON. Um, it also is only ES5, which is uh, something. and. But it does have infrequent releases, so once a year or once a quarter or so. Um, so that's one reason why we didn't want to go with it. And it also has really bad debugging support. So um, it would actually, when we tried to debug with it, it would just crash the emulator. Um, it wasn't, it's not very usable if you try to debug with it. 
Um, so that brings us into J2V8, which is um, another another framework that that exposes the JavaScript thing on Android. Um, it has no auto mapping, so you have to manually map everything you want to bring over. Uh, it supports Java functions or calling Java functions from JavaScript, which is cool. Uh, like the others, this one is also only ES5. Um, so this one also d only does manual memory management. So this is like the pre-ARC days with Objective-C. So you would, you have to do retain and releases on all your objects. Um, and there's also not great documentation on it. It's mostly through blog posts. Um, there's probably four or five blog posts describing how everything works that it's not great if you actually like dig into it. Um, and so debugging it is also very difficult. You have to compile it and all of its dependencies and then uh, have them all in your app in order to debug with it. Um, and it only has a single person maintainer. So we also don't want to take the risk of having to maintain this ourselves. Um, but performance wise, on the CPU, J2V8, it's about the same. It uses about 45, 45 more megs of memory. And it almost doubles the bundle size, which is uh, not great. And then duct tape, it just crashed the emulator, so we weren't really able to test it. Uh, and these are all on a Pixel 2. Um, so React Native. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, like no talk about JavaScript on client would be complete without talking a little bit about React Native. So we didn't really look into it because it's really focused on UI. Um, and it has a pretty large overhead that we didn't want to have to deal with. Um, and But I'll go into a little bit of detail if you didn't watch any, any of the other talks this week. Um, it is single-threaded. Um, and to pass objects between JavaScript, React Native JavaScript, and the and native code, it just uses JSON. Um, that's really uh, all I have to say <laughs> about React Native. But that brings me into our uh, our next speedboat, which is Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin is great uh, because Kotlin is like a mixture of Scala, Scala, and Swift. Um, so at Twitter, we use Scala on our servers uh, almost primarily, and uh, Swift is like my favorite language, <laughs> so kind of mixing the two is pretty is pretty nice. Uh, it's very performant. Uh, Android it's obviously native. Uh, iOS it compiles to LLVM bytecode, which also uh, will run natively, and it's designed for multi-platform out of the box. So we can we can have the same exact code running on iOS, Android, and web. All the same. Um, so speaking of web, uh, Kotlin JS. So Kotlin JS is really n is nice. Um, it has natural interrupt with uh, JavaScript, so you can call directly into your Kotlin library with your JavaScript, your existing JavaScript. Um, it does provide a source map, so you can um, actually walk through the Kotlin code inside of something like Chrome with the source map. Uh, we did, so if you want to include the standard library uh, for Kotlin JS, it's over two megabytes, which is way too large for um, the Twitter app, the Twitter web app, because we're in developing markets and basically worldwide, and having to serve up that is not a great user experience. Um, but the JetBrains team has a dead code elimination tool, which um, eliminates a lot of the, it strips out a lot of the code, um, but it doesn't support libraries like we need it to. Um, but it's, that's, that's all right, um, because my, my teammate is very, or I work with really smart people, so my teammate found a very clever workaround, and his workaround was this. So if we add this, these five lines to our, the bottom of our library, it tricks the the dead code elimination tool that this is actually an app, and it strips out everything that we don't use. Uh, but this code obviously doesn't do anything. 
and that got that got the size way down from over two megabytes down to a couple hundred kilobytes. Um, so Kotlin on iOS, um, there's not that much to talk about. Um, it, it generates an Objective-C interface, so we can use Objective-C or Swift. Uh, it uses ARC, um, which is just like uh, just like using Swift or Objective-C. Uh, and it doesn't include a JVM, so it runs without a JVM on iOS, which is great. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to briefly detour and talk a little bit about uh, threading in iOS. So in threading in iOS, uh, we have we have our threads, and we have our main queue. Uh, Apple has an abstraction on top of threads called Grand Central Dispatch, which abstracts the threads into queues. So we have our main queue, which runs on the main thread. Then we have our serial queues, which you, if you queue up a bunch of work on the same queue, they'll run in FIFO order. and uh, they're great if you want to uh, if you have resources that are dependent on other things finishing. Uh, and then there's also concurrent queues, which will run concurrently. <laughs> um, but so with Grand Central Dispatch, there's no guarantee that any specific queue will run on any specific thread, um, which is fine for Objective C or Objective C and Swift because objects are immutable between threads, so you can change an object and have it be changed on a different thread. Um, and then there, but that does cause issues if you try to modify it at the same time on multiple threads, but that's a separate talk. Um, but Kotlin objects are not mutable between threads. So you have to have a single thread for Kotlin and then Kotlin will just manage its threads based on that main thread. Um, so we had to create a new thread um, which became the Kotlin main thread at that point. That that was the biggest roadblock we ran into getting Kotlin working on iOS. Um, so the code that we have running on iOS that we got running is this Kotlin code. Um, I'll go through it, but all this does is um, goes through our, our trackers, which just keep track of whether we need to fire events or not. Um, so and then if we need to fire an event, we just fire it. So we have our scribe listener, which is a interface or a protocol, whichever, whichever uh, language you prefer, <laughs> um, which is just listening for our, our, our scribe event. Um, just, it's just listening for the event name. So then it will go and do native stuff with it. Uh, so we have our trackers array, which again, trackers just keep track of things. Uh, so this one keeps track of um, whether someone's watched a video for some amount of time. Uh, then we have our on tick event, which the player will call every frame or every couple of frames. That then will update the trackers, and then we check uh, we check all the trackers if they need to be fired. Uh, then just let them fire, and then we'll we send our event back to the scribe listener. Um, so, and then we also have this JS name. Um, so, the Kotlin transpiler to JavaScript uh, mangles the names a little bit. So, we have to add this JS name to to our public methods that we want to use in JavaScript that um, tells it tells it what we want the exact name to be. Um, and I'll go into how the how it mangles it in a minute. Um, so the Kotlin transpiler will will create this JavaScript. Um, it's not the most readable, but it is actually you could actually see what it's doing. It's not it's not doing anything that complex. So up here we have our uh, initializer or our constructor, um, which just creates our scribe listener and our our tracker array. Uh, then we have our on tick event, which just checks if any of our trackers, or just updates any all of our trackers. Um, and then, as you see, it, the onTick event is the exact name we said in the, the JS name. Uh, and then check for events. It mangled that name by adding an underscore, then an identifier on it. 
So that's that's how co the transpiler will mangle the names. It's not it's not serious. You can still see what it's doing, but it's just something. If you want to call it from JavaScript, it just makes it a little, di little difficult. Um, and then yeah, this just goes through and asks all of our trackers if they want to fire an event or not. Um, and then for Objective C, it generates this header. Um, obviously, the shortened version of it. Um, so we have our scribe listener, which listens, which just is listening for our string. Um, so we create a class with that method, and then we can just feed it to our initializer here, which will take it and fire that string when it needs to. Then we have our on tick uh, with player state method, which we will just call every time the player updates. Um, which that brings me into uh, C++. <laughs> um, it's everyone's favorite. <laughs> Um, there's not a lot about lot to say about C++ on iOS. Uh, it works. <laughs> um, it works natively. <laughs> um, but Android, I learned the other day um, at the speaker's dinner that it's actually really hard to support on Android um, because Android has all the different uh, all the different architectures for their processors that has to, that C, the C++ has to be compiled for. Um, and it's just it's just a huge head, huge headache to try to compile for them. Um, so our main issue is getting it working for web uh, because we can't use WebAssembly because WebAssembly requires browser support, and not every browser we support um, has WebAssembly support. Um, so we found a framework that transpiles C plus plus to JavaScript. Um, it's usable. It's not the best experience. <laughs> um, the C++, like, there's some issues, like, you can't really use C++ classes from JavaScript, and there's just some other minor, or some other things that are, makes it difficult. Um, but overall, the bundle size was within reason, so it was within our, the limits we set out for. Um, so I, I guess I'll address the elephant in the room. Um, are we going to rewrite all of our code in one of these? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, so, uh, JavaScript on Android is just not a great experience. So having, having to support JavaScript on Android is just a huge headache that we don't want to work with. Um, Kotlin looked like a great, looked like a great uh, thing to use, but uh, but the multi-platform support is only experimental right now, so it's, so we don't want to have to take on the risk of it changing significantly in the future. Um, and also, getting Kotlin working with our iOS CI uh, is just going to be a massive pain that we don't want to have to deal with, and getting every iOS engineer. Who wants to use Kotlin, uh, or wants to use Kotlin, or doesn't want to use Kotlin, ha requiring them to have the Kotlin compiler on their machine uh, is going is just a huge hassle. Um, and so C++ is C++. <laughs> um, it has a very steep learning curve, um, and then passing objects between native iOS code or native Android code. To C++ is very difficult, um, and it's just something we didn't want to have to deal with too much. Um, and there, there are some other like minor things that aren't really about the language themselves. So, like our players on every one of our platforms, so iOS, Android, web, are significantly different. Um, like different enough that it just it's not easy to support all of them, or not easy to create like a universal framework to cover them all. Um, also, um, my team's code is mostly static. So uh, with our, my code being static, um, there are actually some classes that I own that I haven't looked at since I started at Twitter uh, over a year ago. Um, and there are some other non, having a non-standard uh, like technical stack. Um, 
will make it hard for new engineers to onboard to our team. Just just like little things like that. And we think we also think that hiring uh, new engineers, having having them to get onboarded into something completely different to to something that they have ever done, uh, is just going to be difficult. And it's also trying to find people who want to work with a multi-platform framework. Um, we think is going to be very difficult. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so we are hiring uh, worldwide. <laughs> uh, I, I had to put this slide in. <laughs> uh, it's careers.twitter.com. Um, and thank you.